we're sitting beside a billionaire. It's like Silicon Valley royalty. That's not even in my intro. Okay, uh, all right. I, I promised Vinod I would be not nearly as mean as previous interviewers. We're gonna have fun together. Welcome to Waterloo. We're really excited you could be here at Hack the North. Appreciate you coming in. It's really exciting to be in front of so many young, excited people. Yeah, we were, doing that. we were hanging out in the green room and the, just the energy, even talking about last year's projects uh, was just absolutely off the charts. So um, high standards, high standards. Anybody who builds glow-in-the-dark LJ, you copied it from last year though, okay? Really, wow. Come on, it's, it's the Friday. Like I understand if you're a little low energy on the Sunday, but it's the Friday. Okay, all right, we're gonna try this. All right, so they did a great introduction. Uh, of the node. I'm going to do a, just a little bit more background and or put things into context. Uh, so for those that don't know the node, he actually has a Bachelor of Technology in Electrical Engineering. Yay, Electrical Engineering. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, from the Ind Indian Institute of Technology. He then decided that wasn't enough engineering and went back for a Master's in Biomedical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. And then to appease all the business gods, he went and got an MBA at Stanford. Um, so, it was funny in the intro, I... M MBAs are a waste of time now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I think they, they call them... Mu they're much cheaper when you run startups. Um, so, I, was, I apologize to the node because all of the accomplishments that Sun Microsystems made long before probably many of you were born um, are very Im impressive, but the best way that I thought I could describe what Sun Microsystems has contributed to the world for all of you was they invented Java. Yes. Okay. So running Sun was obviously fun. Um, it was also trying at times. He then decided that helping other people run businesses would be even more challenging and became a venture capitalist at a big barrier firm. That was enough fun that he wanted to run his own in 2004. To give you an idea of the scope of Coastal Ventures, just so that we can set the stage for the types of companies and opportunities that he sees. Kosla has invested in 445, or 445 investments in 254 companies. And I can say with certainty, having spent enough time in the Bay Area, that the average partner at a VC firm sees between 1,000 and 2,000 deals cross their desk. Is that about right each year? Yeah, that's probably an underestimate. So imagine how many companies are pitching him on the next big thing. And they only, only wrote 254 checks since 2004. Okay? So that's the scope and scale of the type of opportunities that he sees. So we're going to talk a little bit about his visibility into the world and share some of those insights. But let's start off maybe a little bit um, closer to home. So as we sit here at the University of Waterloo, you know, let's talk a little bit about maybe your time in school. What got you interested in engineering in the first place? You know, um, I, I, I was always a social misfit. I didn't sort of get along with normal people and do normal things. I was always curious about technology. And by the time I was 16, I was religiously wed to technology and in fact said it was gonna be my only religion. Uh, I like which, it. Which didn't make many people happy, but uh, I, I was very happy and have stuck with that since as my only religion. But uh, one of the reasons I love talking to young people is I was 16 when I read an article about Andy Grove, a Hungarian immigrant going from Hungary to Silicon Valley to start the Intel. And I said to myself, and I, was, I vividly remember being 15 or 16, if he can do it, why can't I? And I fell in love with the idea there and then of starting my own company. Uh, mind you, I'd never known anybody in technology. I'd never known anybody in business. My dad was in the Indian Army, so I only knew people in the military. Uh, and I came up with this dream, and it sort of worked out. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. Uh, he's, nice he's thing humble, is, too. I never, I never really applied for another job in my life and I never ended up working for anybody. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Which, which, which is great motivation for all of you. That's right. I couldn't agree more. Okay, so if you were a student today, what do you think you would study? 
Would you still study electrical engineering or would you try something different? You know, um, one of the really interesting things I've observed is nothing you learn is relevant to what you end up doing. <laughs> I, and here I thought that might be controversial. <laughs> um, but what is really important is to be able to go into any area and learn about it very rapidly. So I just finished writing a 100-page document on the change in healthcare brought on by data science. I, uh, I'll put it up on my website pretty soon. I just, hopefully on the way back, I can... Uh, finish it. It has about an hour of work to go. Uh, the point is, now I can sit in a forum with a bunch of doctors and know much more. That's an arrogant view, but you have to have a point of view uh, uh, about how medicine might evolve than any doctor I've run into. Because they're too wed to their point of view. My point is, when you're this young, try and cover as many subjects as possible be as broad as opposed to very specialized, especially in an undergraduate degree. I, I think in this day and age, you learn how to learn and learn a lot of fundamental concepts. Um, any liberal arts majors here? Woo! Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I wrote a fairly controversial piece in Medium, probably in February, about why liberal arts is a waste of time in general. <laughs> uh, as you might guess, the people at Yale didn't like it very much. Uh, but, but there is hope. <laughs> yeah, your money is not at all a waste. <laughs> uh, I, I defined a new curriculum called liberal sciences, which was a way of thinking and learning how to think, which, by the way, was the original purpose of liberal arts. Liberal arts started uh, in, in Greece as being a responsible citizen about Greek civic life. By the way, slaves did a lot of the work so the Greeks could actually think and, uh, <laughs> uh, in that day and age. Uh, uh, that's where liberal arts started. But learning how to think broadly uh, is really important. If you're doing computer science, do a bit of neuroscience. Learn psychology, learn philosophy and logic. I mean, I'd be as broad as possible. That's great advice. Um, Oli, let's talk about one of your favorite subjects and actually one of the subjects that the audience loves too, artificial intelligence. Yeah. All right. Sounds about 40%. Uh, okay. Why do you get so excited about artificial intelligence? Yeah. You know, there are transitions that happen. So... Let me give you a little bit of a story that's hard to believe. I started coding on punch cards. So our main, mainframe computer at our university at IIT Delhi had 32 kilobytes of memory. Um, I was really good at assembly. Uh, uh, and even went to binary, shift lefts and shift rights to do multiplies when I didn't have enough memory. Uh, that's pretty hardcore. Yeah. but. <laughs> If you said to somebody in 1980 there'd be a computer in every home, they'd have literally laughed at you. In 82, when I put my email address on my business card, people thought that was like really nerdy. Right? <laughs> uh, if you said to anybody, grandma would be e e uh, uh, doing email, they would have laughed you out of the room. In 1995, I started working on TCP IP and internet protocols and expanding the net. Nobody believed in 1995 that TCP IP would ever be a public network. We started a company called Juniper and it, every customer I talked to said they'd never buy that product, right? Um, and frankly, if it had been left to the Cisco's and uh, Nortels and well, Alcatels of the world. We love Nortel. We, we'd have. <laughs> yeah, Nortel was a big company back then. Uh, if you have time, I'll tell you funny stories about Nortel. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going to add that to the end of the list. Keep going. Yeah, add it to the end of the list. Uh, 
But Cisco told me they'd never do a router that would teach PIP only or ever above OC12, ever. And every customer told me they'd only use ATM in the public networks. So uh, first, one important lesson, don't believe anything you hear uh, from people. <laughs> okay, back to AI, uh, back to AI. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, nobody believed in the internet in, 2000, uh, in 1995. Nobody believed in mobile in 2000. The iPhone didn't exist till 2007. Uh, your question on AI, I think it's a larger change than mobile was. Wow. Think like, about uh, it. That's a, that's a big statement. That's a very big statement. Uh, in 20, uh, so about four years ago, I took two months and went back and just spent the two months reading every textbook on AI I could, reading every algorithm, trying to understand it. Things have changed a lot, but I went back and went back learning. Why? Because I think it's that important. Uh, the change we've seen since the iPhone was introduced in 2007 and Facebook, and most people don't realize the iPhone didn't exist on January 1 of 2007. Right. If you imagine that change, we'll see a larger change in the next seven to 10 years. Okay, so I wasn't planning on going off script here, but let's do it anyway. So the reason that mobile like is so big is because literally everybody on the planet is going to buy a mobile phone. And in fact, the density we're finding is that people own multiple mobile phones. So is every single person going to have AI in this world you envision? Uh, maybe a 10 AIs or a 100 AIs? Okay. Yes. Uh, I can't, let's imagine the right world, the rate of change in AI. Uh, some of the stuff coming out of uh, places like Google and Facebook. Whether you look at some of the work going on Facebook M that Jan LeCun's doing, look at some of the work out of DeepMind. Yep. Um, I love AlphaGo to me. That, that was awesome. That, that was almost a religious experience for me. Wow. Uh, <laughs> My, yeah, yeah, I understand when technology you know, the, is your religion. When technology wins in that way and proves for the first time there is no such thing as intuition that can't be replicated. I'm one of those people who believes the best music will be composed by AI, the best stories will be written by AI, I can't imagine needing a doctor in 15 years. Why would I want all the human biases uh, that come with it? Um, so I suspect, and this is the reason goes back to, if I were a student today, what would I study? Yeah. Most jobs that exist, which means greater than 50%, will be eliminated in 30 or 40 years. Now I may be off by 10 or 15 years one way or another, but it's a very radical change that's being underestimated. I wrote about it in Forbes in 2014. Yep. I went back and looked at the piece and I didn't want to change anything or rewrite it, so I'm pretty happy with it. Um, <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether you're a radiologist or an oncologist or a farm worker. We're, we're making machines that build hamburgers, uh, bad for the people who make $8 an hour, we're making machines that pick lettuce or weed corn. At the other end, uh, almost all the serious medicine or really skilled jobs will be done by AI. Uh, it's very exciting, but almost every human capability, I think it's only a matter of time. And I'm one of those patient ones that uh, as long as it happens while I'm alive, I don't care whether it happens in five years or 15. Uh, is going to be replaced. That's really, really exciting. Okay, so traditionally the argument of software eats the world and so on is that it creates new jobs, right? Technology then creates new jobs and so on. But in the world you're describing, then the new job gets done by an even smarter computer and there is no new job, right? Like, so we're talking about like some or 20, 50, I don't know, some percentage of the population has jobs and the rest of the population is doing what, yeah. throwing rocks at the other 50%? <laughs> like, seems like a pretty broken system. Um, I call that a failure of imagination, if I might. Okay, yeah, great, <laughs> I like this. This is going well, we're getting controversial now. <laughs> um, and I covered this 
fairly extensively in this piece I did in Forbes in 2014. You know, first, it's all speculation, very hard to imagine what a right. world like that would look like, so I'm more likely to be wrong than right. Yep. But what's likely to happen is not going to be what's happened in the past. There is a discontinuity, and so the people, uh, and I've sort of had a few battles with Mark Andreessen who argues your argument that all technology always creates new jobs. The fact is, at some point, technology exceeds a human being. In the past, every piece of technology, from a little lever to a steam engine to a car to a plane, was leveraged by human beings to do more. Yes. When you don't need the human part to do more of the things we know about, it's hard to imagine the same rule of economics being true. And I think uh, we'll prove that out, I'm pretty certain. Now, I'm the first one to admit there's jobs created that we didn't imagine. X Games wasn't a profession. Yes. It is. Right? MMA. America's got talent or, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, who knows what people will do. I think it's a serious question what people will do or spend their time on. Video games. Uh, <laughs> I would never have imagined esports being as big as it has become. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Apparently only someone, one person plays <laughs> games. <laughs> so, I don't well, know what, I, I don't know I what you're all seen missing. Esports being big as a market of people playing, watching other people. I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, right? I, you know, billion uh, dollar company just to watch people play games. Yeah. But they're so, good. So there is a question, what will motivate people? What will entice people? There'll always be new things to do, but not for most of the people. Right. Right? And, but the good news is, and this is where the failure of imagination comes in, if in fact that world is true, we will have so much GDP growth, so much productivity growth, we'll have plenty to go around. So, A surplus society. So I, I believe in a surplus society. I believe we will have very high levels of minimum basic income and other things like that that right. will address some of the issues around. So uh, how will people pay for this? Well, okay. they'll get free money to consume. Okay, let's, let's go on the other side of, of artificial intelligence. We've talked about some of the risks to society, but a number of prominent people from Elon Musk to Sam Altman are worried that artificial intelligence will create super intelligence resulting literally in the destruction of humankind. What do you think? Uh, well, I didn't say they'd be easy questions. I just said they'd yeah, be nice. Yeah, this is easy. Uh, <laughs> look, technology is the tool. We have to remember it. Yep. And it, most technologies can be used for good or bad. Nuclear is the most classic example. You can build a nuclear bomb or nuclear power. Um, technology, I think, is without judgment. Yep. Uh, and then it's up to us to use it well or poorly. Biotechnology can be a weapon or it can be a tool, a productive tool for society. I think they're right in we should worry about it. I think they're wrong in uh, raising, uh, saying this is going to happen or that we can't do much about it. Uh, clearly, the bad guys will try and harness these technologies as much as the good guys. And in most like, cases, there's a battle between the two. And we'll have to see what, uh, what we have to do. Now, Technology itself taking control, I won't say it's not possible, but most of the detailed specula speculation I've seen about it is naive. So uh, there's a guy called Nick Bostrom. He's yes. spoken at TAD, written a book. The book's pretty crappy, to be honest. It's, it's very, like, theory-based. Well, it's very naive and hypothetical, and, and frankly, I can almost... But I don't want to dismiss the possibility just because Nick wrote a bad book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you can tweet that. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think it is something to worry about. I do think we should be cautious. I don't think, like any powerful technology, we should regulate it. I mean, we had 
uncontrolled proliferation of nuclear, that'd be a bad thing. Right. So we should pay attention to it. We should spend time on it. There are ethical issues involved. Uh, now, I'm not a big fan of uh, ethicists in general because they never clarify whose ethics they're using. Right. Uh, but I do think these are issues to worry about. Okay, let's, um, we'll switch off AI for a little bit. Um, one of the best questions, I've watched a lot of your videos lately. Um, one of the best questions I thought you, you answered really well, um, which is a little controversial, was is the customer always right? This, this is a mantra that is literally bred into people from like the day they're born. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a bad idea uh, to assume that's true. Uh, in fact, I'd almost say listening to customers is only a good idea if you're doing incremental things. If you go back, uh, let me take the iPhone because I think it's a pretty classic thing in the last 10 years that's changed the world pretty dramatically. Every customer that was surveyed, uh, and by the way, the dominant companies were Motorola and Nokia in the cell phone, mobile cell phone business. There was business. this little Canadian startup called BlackBerry, but. Yeah, BlackBerry too. <laughs> I keep forgetting them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for, uh, for, for, the, for the record, they're still the only one out of all three of those that actually produces phones. But you know, anyway, keep going. For now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you look at the reviews sort of in, uh, before the iPhone came out, everybody said, who wants to buy a phone without a keyboard? Yes. Right? Who wants to buy a phone for $699, which was uh, $700 was the opening price yep. for the iPhone. There was all this criticism. Why? Because all the other phone makers did focus groups and listened to their customers. It is not the job of a customer of a technology to be visionary. It is the visionary's job to invent the future. So if you want to extrapolate the past, that sort of works. But uh, Alan Kay said the best way to predict the future is to invent it. I go a little further and say invent the future you want, and hopefully others will follow. Right? Uh, I think you have to be bold and look way out there. Uh, we should come back to some of the specific areas where people are doing this. Yeah, it's on And list. lead the world with a vision, not so much follow or listen to market studies or focus groups. It's not your average person's job to imagine what they would do with a phone. I mean, I have a talk on my website that's actually embarrassingly bad. Uh, it was done in 2004, and I leave it on to remind myself and everybody how hard it is to think about these things. Uh, the talk uh, I gave at a mobile phone conference, and I titled it, The Device That Used to Be a Phone. So I, I, I think I've got one thing right, which is uh, this thing we call a phone would not be used just for talking, right. or even mostly for talking. So it occurred to me that there were so many other uses that talking would become a minor part of a phone. Just another app. Just another app. Now, I leave that on because I tried to imagine what it would be used for, and it's embarrassing what the things I came up with. Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Uh, my point is, and this is where when I talk about AI 30, 40 years, I sort of make sure people realize I'm speculating. And like I said, I'm more likely to be wrong than right. Uh, but just because you can't imagine what that can be, just I couldn't imagine what a phone would be used for, even though I could see all this other capability coming along and depended on others to invent Snapchat or Facebook or Twitter or, right. uh, or, or even the way Google search has panned out. Uh, it's important that, to realize that it's your job, especially if you came here from all over the world, to invent this future and lead the world and have a point of view and stop listening to the people who tell you. You know, MBAs are irrelevant just because they teach you to listen to your customer. Right. Right? 
Uh, I used to teach a class in the early 90s at Stanford Business School on why not to listen to your customer. Because their job is to think about what's next and incremental, and your job is to invent a different radical future if you want to change the world. Which actually, the reason, part of, part of the reason, there's many reasons it's hard, is because it, there's conflict. If you just do what your customer tells you to do, and then it seems like everybody's happy. But when you go in and literally tell your customer that they're morons, and that they're doing it all wrong, and they're not envisioning the way this is supposed to be done, that's not an easy sale. Well, you don't have to tell them they're morons, you can think it. <laughs> so, I, I sell into insurance, you really do sometimes. Right? Uh, let, me, let me talk to you about a, another really important issue you didn't bring up. So, you're right? jumping all over my list. Okay, here. yeah. Uh, I, I want to talk to the audience, not to you. Well, uh, <laughs> I, 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 we're, trying, we're trying to facilitate. Yeah. Really? really? Um, Apparently, the illusion of control is gone. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's important for all of you to realize, and I speak to audiences like this for one reason. I normally say, I'll take an hour of my time if I can convince one person to do something different than they were going to do otherwise, if they hadn't heard the task. This is That's my goal for every talk I give. This one is a, person a great talk. audience for that. This is a great audience for that. The fact is, I normally say 95% of people do what's expected of them, the way the path is planned for them, and, and I sort of generally don't like to speak to them. Right? And the sad part is, even in this audience, 80, 90% will end up doing what's expected. But the other five or 10% will change the world with unreasonable views like Elon Musk saying, I'll start Tesla despite the fact that I know nothing about cars and car making and GM spent a billion dollars doing the EV1 electric vehicle and been unsuccessful at it. Huh? It's totally unreasonable thing. Many of you will try these things. I hope you do. I hope I can encourage you. Here's the thing I will tell you about risk. Most people don't like risk, hence they will only do incremental things. And by definition, if you don't like risk, you're going to be precluded from doing interesting things with your life. Um, think about it, and I always complain, most people reduce risk to the point where they increase the probability of success, but reduce the consequences of success to inconsequential. I'd rather do the reverse. Increase the probability of success, of uh, failure, reduce the probability of success, and increase the consequences of success to really consequential. So, and and that's, those are trade-offs each of you will make in your life. Yeah, so part of the challenge with failure is it's unpleasant, and so there's a reason to fear it, right? But in, in reality, and that's one of the things that Silicon Valley has done very well is that not that they celebrate failure because no one remembers the failed companies you had before Sun, for example. We don't talk about those. Um, but they do. So uh, let me ask you a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> anybody here, including you. I know the answer. You know the I, answer because you heard me talk about it. This is anybody true. know the company I started with a, about three months before I started Sun? The better question is how many people knew of Sun? How many people know about okay, Sun? Okay, all right, yeah. Sun, all right, okay, all right. Does anybody know the other company I started with the same co-founder, Scott McNeely, three months before we started Sun? Looks like you got crickets. Yeah. You know, the point is, yeah, failure feels bad, but you get over it, and it's a great learning experience. Yes. Nothing like failure to learn from. So why be afraid of failure? I like to say my willingness to fail as, is what has given me the ability to succeed. In fact, if I was not willing to fail, and my first job really was a, in, out of college was a startup. Right. Uh, if I hadn't been willing to fail, uh, I wouldn't have succeeded. So, and then that's, that's a fine line in the sense that 
Um, so one of the favorite stories that I heard about you when I was doing my research is that a customer decided that they were going to leave Sun. You've heard this story a million times, and I'm sorry. Um, they were going to leave Sun. You literally got on a plane, went to their office, would not leave. They, like, you're like, I'm not leaving until I talk to the CEO. He finally met you in the parking lot as he's trying to leave, and you convinced him to fly his whole team to another city to meet with you because they'd, they'd already signed a contract with your competitor. And by the end of the next day, you had them all signed on a handwritten contract. That is not a person who's willing to embrace failure, right? Like that, 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 is, that is not like, I'm okay if it doesn't work, right? So, I, well, there, there, there's, there's a difference between, uh, I, I like to say a no's a maybe and a maybe is a yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have to be persistent. You have to be persistent. Yes. Uh, if, if you're a founder and your life and survival depends on it, you can't take no for an answer. Uh, most of the time it works out much better than you thought. Uh, that's one of my favorite stories. I just was too young to know. I was more your age than mine. Too young to know to, that when somebody signed a contract with somebody else, it's the end, end of the bid. Right. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah. um, that's the beauty of being young I, and naive. But <laughs> it, it's true of almost everything, right? Um, when I got my green card, you know, no lawyer would take my case because it was so complicated. I wasn't working for the people who applied for my green card. Right? Right. And I didn't try and hide it. I didn't lie on my application. I just confused the immigration officer uh, enough. <laughs> if you can't convince, you can confuse. Same thing, uh, you know, I got, uh, many of you will try and apply to college. I applied to Stanford Business School because I thought that was the way to get to Silicon Valley and start the startup I wanted to start, they turned me down. Uh, and they said, what do, I said, what do I need? And they said, two years of work experience. So that next year, I worked two full-time jobs uh, <laughs> and got two years of work experience, applied again, and they turned me down again. Um, and then I had an argument with them, and I mounted a campaign to get in, let in three days before classes started. Uh, you just don't take no for an answer. Um, but, but that's the kind of persistence entrepreneurs yes. have. Awesome. All right, we're getting along really well. This is great. All right, I'm gonna take, I'm, okay, we're gonna try and go back to the hackathon. So there's a thousand awesome people in this room, well, not tech, 700 in this room, and then a whole bunch else watching other well. Um, they're gonna spend this weekend hacking together what they hope to be an absolutely epic project, right? Right? Right. If you were staying for the weekend, what would you build? What would I build? Um, let me answer the question two ways. First, okay. let me directly answer your question. What would I try and build? I, and I referred to it, and I did uh, ask me anything on Quora uh, probably uh, a few months ago, maybe nine months ago. Okay. Um, and so you can read it. I'll repeat that answer. I think the world needs a digital doctor. That means I am convinced in 15 years, and hopefully in five, and I think it can be done in three or five, uh, I will get better medical diagnosis in a village in India than I can get at Stanford five miles from my house. Why? Because Stanford will still have experts and gurus and specialist doctors, and my cell phone in my village in India will have knowledge. You know, all 5,000 articles on oncology that were published this year that are relevant to me, if I'm a cancer patient or my heart disease, or right. embody all of scientific knowledge. And we just invested in a company in Toronto where I convinced them to go after capturing all human knowledge in a Q&A format. I'm pretty excited about this company called Meta uh, in Toronto. Um, that's what I would hack together, okay. sort of a Q&A. My, my son just graduated from Stanford in June with uh, three different degrees. Um, 
That's a fascinating evolution. Uh, and I've been trying to convince him to do this. So um, it's, it's, there's some hard problems with it in how you introduce it in the market and all that. Anybody interested in that area, I'm happy to talk to you about it. it it's a classic AI application yep. that should happen and will happen. Yep. Uh, but let me answer the question more broadly. I know many of you are coders, but independent of what you're doing, including the liberal arts majors. Uh, uh, you know, liberal arts shouldn't be an excuse to take life easy, which is my problem with it, or not be rigorous. Uh, but there's plenty, in fact, liberal arts done right probably has more upside in providing breadth than any of the engineering disciplines do, right? if you did a rigorous curriculum, right. right? People do French as a second language, no offense to French, but computer language is much more important than French as a second language. Uh, uh, if, if you're gonna be a global citizen. <laughs> uh, you're speaking their language. Right? Uh, uh, to me, there's, there's a universal language, and then the second language should be computer science or a computer language and learn, even if you're never gonna code. But the point I wanna make is no matter which area you pick, there's really, really interesting opportunities to innovate. Uh, we have a guy who hopefully in the next few months will launch his own rocket launcher. At the other end, a couple of years ago, this professor came to me and said he wanted to reinvent the hamburger. Right? Today we have probably more than 40 PhDs working on reinventing the hamburger. <laughs> Think about it. Now, happens to be that hamburgers just in the United States is a $100 billion market. Yes. Pretty good size. And it involves a lot of cruelty to animals, which he hates. A lot of bad practices in uh, concentrated uh, animal feeding operations. Lots of water. I, I could go on and on. Um, uh, and trying to change that is a great vision to have. And who would have uh, assumed you can innovate in hamburgers? His goal is to eliminate animal husbandry on the planet which accounts for 30% of the land area on this planet. Wow. Right? We also happen to be doing eggs and mayonnaise. Similar kind of idea. My point is whether you're doing rocketry or medicine or hamburgers, or we investors in a nuclear fission reactor. Right. And just this today, I spent time looking at fusion. Nothing is out of bounds if you're creative enough and it's not to say all areas are equally easy, but I'd say to all of you, in almost every area I can think of, there's room for innovation. You know, I'm so excited about AI, artificial intelligence, but I'm also excited about 3D printing. I'd love to do 3D printing houses. I've spent a fair amount of time looking at how you do housing differently. And let's at least start with homeless housing be a great project to work on, or free doc digital doctors, or free oncologists, uh, or f better hamburgers and better eggs. So almost every area you look at, whether it's transportation, or healthcare, or cybersecurity, or hamburgers, or food, or construction, is open for innovation. That's my main message. I'd love to be able to hack across all these areas. Challenge set. I like it. Okay. Let's, because um, you're answering all of my questions without me asking them. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's go to the audience. So remember, if you want to ask Vinod a question, uh, tweet with the Hack the North hashtag. Uh, first great one here. What will be the largest company in the world in 20 years, and do they exist today? Uh, first, nobody can answer that kind of question. But we can speculate. 
You know, it could be transportation. So think of Uber. Think of Uber with a driverless car technology. I believe it replaces all public transportation, especially city transportation. They may be long haul, but even those, you know, it's silly to have a train when you can have a small pod. The only reason we have a train is somebody's driving it or a bus. Okay? Most of the cost is in the human being. If you eliminate the driver, which I think is very, not hard to imagine how to do, transportation is a very large thing that can be replaced. Yes. Um, having said that, uh, nuclear energy could be a massive market, could be larger than transportation. Suddenly a trillion dollar market wouldn't seem that large. Um, you know, it's very hard to speculate. Construction, if you really change the nature of construction, it could be a very, very large market. So if you could very low cost print 3D houses that are highly customized, um, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to predict, but I'd say let your imagination loose and things do evolve. Awesome. Okay. Um, what do you think the primary medium will be to interact with AI? You know, humans aren't going to evolve that fast. So the way we communicate with other humans is probably the way we'll communicate with AI. Now, whether newer things happen, for example, uh, being able to communicate directly from your brain to something. There's plenty of really cool experiments in that. Um, that would be cool. It's a higher speed interface than through your hands or eyes or ears right. or, or mouth. Um, I, I, I've got to imagine that'll happen. Um, for those of you interested in this topic, there's some amazing mind-blowing research where they essentially had a person watch a video of something, looked at the EEG, and tried to reconstruct the video the person was watching. It's amazingly good for as early as it is. Wow. Think about it, just using brain signals to recreate what the brain's watching, and that's with uh, fMRI and others that have relatively huge pixels, like centimeter sized pixels, if I might, yep. not micron sized pixel. Uh, I can imagine those, those things making huge progress. Um, so lots of industries have changed over the last 30 or 50 years. Um, one of the few that hasn't- Not been, enough. Not enough. One of the, well, okay, one of the many. Uh, that hasn't changed uh, is the place we're sitting in. Universities are essentially the same as they were, you know, when you went to university. What do you think is going to change with the universities in the next decade or two? Do you think that they're never going to change? You're just going to go to business? Like, what's what is your thought on post-secondary? So first, let me come back to your question about artificial intelligence, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you have artificial intelligence, yeah. The interesting question is, why do you need education? So the usual answer to unemployment from economists and others is we should invest more in education. If, if my speculation, I'll keep calling it speculation, is right, education does nothing for that problem. No matter how much you educate people, right. the AI is better, faster, more knowledgeable, more capable. That's not to say education will go away. I might. I enjoy technical problems. No matter what I'm looking at, I'm solving a puzzle. And frankly, between solving that kind of a puzzle or doing, playing a puzzle in Nintendo, to me, it's the same. It's stimulation for my brain. Uh, somebody else might like a Nintendo puzzle. I happen to like a physics puzzle. Right. Uh, so people will pursue education for its own purpose to essentially challenge themselves not to get a job. Uh, that, that will change the nature of education if that happens. Now, when that happens, hard to say. Right. Uh, organizations have a lot of lethargy. And so change, and this is a really important point, 
almost always happens on the periphery. Why? Um, usually, the center of everything has too much conventional wisdom, too much experience, too much knowledge of how things are done to innovate. So innovation happens at the periphery uh, of things. And so things start on the edges. I was with some people from, in fact, three major auto companies in the last week. Three years ago, none of them believed electric cars would be important. Because of Tesla, now they all believe the only kind of new car that's important is an electric car. In just three years. In they had this three, epiphany. Yeah. Um, because there was no way for the industry to convince itself. The, the funny thing is, in 2012, the Department of Energy in the U.S. Uh, made a forecast for electric cars in 2030. That is a lower number of cars than Tesla will probably ship next year, or this year. Tesla alone. This is why you don't want to rely on experts. You don't want to rely on forecasts. You want to just invent the future like Elon Musk did at Tesla. And, and so, you know, back to education. It'll happen on the periphery. It's already happening. Um, I go back and do an online course if I need to refresh myself or learn something new. Um, I could go back to a university, but it's a waste of time today. And so that may happen. Uh, I think if you ask me if universities will exist in 10 or 20 years, they'll probably exist in very similar forms. If you ask me what percentage of education will be in universities, it'll be the same number of students, and education outside the universities will start growing exponentially and in new ways. Very cool. Okay, speaking of Elon Musk, what do you think about the statement that we're living in a simulation? Uh, that's from the audience. I wish I'd come up. Yeah, that's a question uh, I'm not qualified to answer. <laughs> um, look, it's, it's not as crazy a question as it seems. If you're a physics major, you could actually make a reasonable hypothesis for parallel universes. It, he does, I mean, he's on video describing what is yeah. a fairly rational set of steps to get to this. No, uh, look, you know, I, w I won't dismiss it, but I'm sort of not going to assign a high probability to it. <laughs> uh, this is a probability question. Yeah. But is there a story there consistent with physics at the best we know it today? Yes, it's possible. Cool. Uh, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin and Ethereum? Oh, yeah, we got fans. Um, Apparently just one. <laughs> how many Bitcoin developers here? Uh, how many people? A few. Yeah, okay. Right. That's all right. That's respectable. Uh, look, the blockchain, let's separate Bitcoin from blockchain. Yeah. Blockchain is an important concept. In fact, we investors in a company called Blockstream that's doing side chains yep. that extend the concept of blockchains. Much of the financial industry that exists today shouldn't exist. I mean, bankers add very little value. If I can appeal to all of you to never go into banking, that'd be great. Uh, I, I get in trouble for saying it, but Wall Street adds way, does way more damage than the value it adds. So they'll make an argument that financial services are an important component. I agree that about 2 to 5% of what happens in Wall Street is actually very important social services. The other 95% encourages behavior and attacks on society that is completely unjustified. And it's a system that perpetuates itself. Uh, I'm not a fan, in fact, uh, I hate dealing with bankers on Wall Street. Um, and then somebody will hate me for it, but that's okay. Sometimes it's nice to be hated by the wrong people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
said no inner city kid ever. Uh, <laughs> but back to your question on Bitcoin. I think it's an important set of services. The problem with Bitcoin as a use for blockchain is it is used too much to circumvent the law. Okay. Right? So illegal drugs, illegal trades. Uh, you can read a book like Darknet, which is really, it's sort of a fascinating read. Uh, and you realize if something's used so much for things that are not part of society, Yep. Or, or the, the lighter, light side of society as opposed to dark. Uh, the system, the, the authorities will do whatever it takes to block it, to discourage, for example, gun trade or, uh, or child slavery or sex trade or, you know, pick your drugs. So. And when that happens, it hurts the Bitcoin system. So I think... For example, there's an ID system in India called the Aadhaar system that a billion people are signed on to. If you are signed IDs to every Bitcoin trade, it's much more likely to grow. It becomes compatible with the financial system. Right. It get, becomes compatible with anti-money laundering and know your customer kind of banking requirements that regulators in most companies had anti-terrorism efforts in most countries, and then it can grow because then it adds efficiency to society. I think it's a really important concept. It's unfortunate it's shackled with illegal activities. Well, it's it's because it grew out of the, the social movement of those types yeah. of people, right? That was a very well, explicit Well, yeah, the age. social movement actually had some good characteristics about it. But unfortunately, yeah. Uh, like I said, technology can be used for good or bad. Yeah. If there's too much bad associated, it becomes harder for it to become mainstream. Yeah, well, I mean, the most logical thing that people tried to use Bitcoin for initially was moving money, right? Which is screwing the bankers we don't like. Okay, so, um, really? You've got a, kind of like a weird boo on that. Anyway, <laughs> I guess you guys love spending money on Western Union to send it back to your family. Okay, uh, which a surprising company that's still around. All right, um, how and do you see... And shouldn't be. I agree. Western Union, like, I mean, anyway. So, virtual reality, how do you see it changing the future? Um, I, th I think it's a new technology, like most new technologies. It's hard to predict how it'll happen. So, some uses, pretty predict. Entertainment, obviously a great use for VR. Right. Or virtual reality. Uh, I think tourism will be an important part of virtual reality. If I can't go to Papua New Guinea, um, by the way, fascinating place, uh, I, I should at least be able to go virtually. Um, there are industrial uses of VR or virtual reality that are even more important, uh, especially uh, if you're in the field working on a complex refinery, not needing to go consult the manual is a classic example, or surgery, uh, other things like that. But hopefully the most interesting uses I can think of today. Awesome. So I'm going to leave this with the last thing that you get to say. What would you tell these thousand people that they should take away from this talk? The one thing, the one piece of advice, if they forgot everything that we've talked about tonight, which I've really enjoyed, um, what would you like to reinforce or tell them? You know, I go back to this issue of, you're, if you're willing to fail, you will allow yourself to succeed. And most people, most people are too influenced by people around them who tell them what is supposed to happen or not happen. I like to say very, very few people have an internal compass that says, here's what I believe in, not what I read, not what my friends expect. I have a belief system and I'm going to go follow my belief system, whether it's live life a certain way or 
go invent a future. So imagine the possible and go try and make it happen. And if, if you don't succeed, one, you learn a lot, two, just try again. One. So imagine the possible would be my one finishing message and don't be afraid of it, especially when you're young and you can afford to fail. Now, after you have three kids and they need to go to college, you need to pay your mortgage, you start to take on responsibility. So you have to balance uh, failure with responsibilities. Yep. But the, and the later in life, especially midlife, you have more of those responsibilities and so you can't ignore them. Um, but early on, you are more free than you think. You are more limited by what you think you can do than what you can actually do. Um, and it's fun to speak to an audience like this. Awesome. Let's give them a huge round of applause. <laughs>